For me, the recent tragic, potentially preventable death of a young child due to asthma in the United Kingdom is really the last straw. Something has got to change in the way that asthma is being managed at the moment. So I suggested a seven-point plan for primary care clinicians to bring about an end to asthma attacks. In summary, this plan requires a major change in attitude by healthcare professionals. And that is to acknowledge firstly that an asthma attack is a warning sign that something serious has gone wrong. And secondly, this may mean that there's a problem with either our treatment of that person or that the person is either not understood or adhered to our management advice and prescriptions. Secondly, there's a need to acknowledge that something must be done in the form of proactive action to change the way that people's asthma is treated and to change systems in primary care practice to prevent further attacks in others. My seven-point plan starts with an acceptance by all that an asthma attack is a significant event that is potentially preventable and is potentially fatal. I've put a link to the plan in the description of this episode. This plan suggests setting up a system for regular critical review of every single asthma attack in the practice to identify modifiable risk factors, to deal with these by optimising care for the individual patient and to then change systems in the primary care practice to prevent attacks in other people. I've discussed some of these in recent podcasts and today I'm going to talk about some more risk factors that clinicians and people with asthma should be aware of. The critical review part of the seven-point plan is to educate the whole practice team about the known risk factors that lead to poor asthma control and attacks. Now this fits in nicely with the World Asthma Day 2024 theme of empowering people with asthma, their clinicians and healthcare managers through asthma education about risk factors for poor asthma outcomes. Now before I continue, if you find these podcasts helpful, please click the follow button so you'll get a reminder whenever a new episode is published. My seven-point plan is described in detail on my website and includes a template to make it easy for a clinician to quickly extract information, and this is information related to factors that are responsible for asthma attacks and that could have been responsible for a person's asthma attack that can be fixed to prevent future attacks. Now, these are called modifiable risk factors. In the last four podcasts, I discussed some of these risk factors in detail, and so please do listen to those if you haven't already done so. These risk factors include excess prescriptions for short-acting reliever inhalers, those are the blue ones, insufficient prescriptions for inhaled corticosteroids, The next preventable factor is about inhaler technique. Now clearly, it's logical and essential that anyone prescribed an inhaler device for their asthma should be able to demonstrate for a clinician that they can use it correctly. Otherwise, the drug cannot possibly work. The key message is to ensure that anyone who has poor inhaler technique is checked as a matter of urgency because it may be necessary to prescribe a different type of inhaler if, despite teaching the person, they cannot use the device that was previously prescribed. The next group of preventable or modifiable factors are in those people who have both asthma and poor asthma control and also have one of the following conditions. That's obesity, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or called GERD, obstructive sleep apnea, food allergy, allergic rhinitis like hay fever or perennial rhinitis like allergy to house dust mite, chronic rhinosinusitis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that's COPD, and pregnancy. Now in this episode, 
I'm going to talk about a number of other risk factors for asthma attacks, some of which can be dealt with or fixed, and some that it is important to be aware of and where possible action can be taken to prevent future attacks. For today, let's talk about smoking, vaping, air pollution, allergies, mental health problems, and socioeconomic factors, all of which, if in combination with asthma are present, could lead to asthma attacks. So first, we know that we need oxygen and clean air to stay healthy. So if someone chooses to breathe smoke or vapours from e-cigarettes into their lungs, or to expose their children or other people around them to uh, these noxious fumes, they're taking a decision to self-harm or to harm others. Now there's lots of evidence that cigarette smoke is harmful in people with asthma. For example, there are three ways that harm is caused. Firstly, oxygen in the air we breathe is essential in order to stay alive. Our bodies need oxygen in order to work properly, and when cigarette smoke is inhaled, it binds very strongly to the red blood cells that carry the oxygen to the organs in our body. And the problem here is one of the gases called carbon monoxide, which you inhale in smoke, binds much more powerfully in the red blood cells than oxygen does. So there's little space left on the red blood cells for the oxygen to bind. So the red blood cells will not be carrying as much oxygen around to the vital organs in the body that that they should be. And so what happens is that when your blood cells arrive in the brain, the brain detects that there's a shortage of oxygen in the blood and then sends a signal to your lungs to tell you to breathe harder because Your brain doesn't know what's going on. It just thinks you're not breathing hard enough to get the oxygen in. And we get the sensation of breathlessness. Now, secondly, the toxins in the smoke, like nicotine, for example, gradually destroy parts of the lungs. And this destruction is irreversible. You can't fix it. And thirdly, because asthma drugs don't work as well in people who smoke, So even though you might be taking the drug regularly, it's not going to work as well as it would if you weren't smoking. Now there is evidence that vaping is also harmful. The evidence is emerging and it will take time, just like the damage that cigarette smoke uh, took, took a long time. Now regarding vaping, I read a report in a medical journal recently about two children who's, who, who had life-threatening asthma attacks due to the vaping. And their lives were saved when they had to have intensive care treatment for respiratory failure, which had occurred following vaping. So it's not a safe alternative to cigarette smoking, which a lot of people believe. Now I should also add that smoking and vaping in children is an alarm signal that there may be child safeguarding issues and those might need to be attended to by safeguarding teams looking after the welfare of children. Air pollution is the next modifiable risk factor that I'd like to talk about. Air pollution was implicated as a cause of the death of a young girl in the United Kingdom and this has resulted in a high-level discussions in the UK to reduce outdoor air pollution. This young girl lived near a major road and the coroner who heard the case at the inquest heard evidence that there were dangerous levels of air pollution on 27 out of the 28 days that she had asthma attacks in the few years before she died. As a result, the coroner agreed that air pollution was a direct cause of this tragic death of this child due to asthma. Food allergy and asthma is a situation that could pose severe risks for a person with both of these diagnoses. These people should be under the supervision of an allergy and an asthma specialist because of the risk of severe and fatal attacks. So it's important, as in all branches of medicine, to find out whether someone who's had an attack may also have food allergy and 
During the review, if food allergy is identified or suspected, that person should be referred to an allergy specialist to have the diagnosis confirmed. Because those people need prescription for injectable adrenaline, which can be carried with them and taken at a moment's notice if they eat something accidentally, which they're allergic to. Other allergies are also important to identify because they may aggravate asthma and cause poor control. And these people should be appropriately treated. And in the case of allergic rhinitis, like hay fever, inhaled corticosteroids are the first line of treatment according to some guideline, according to most guidelines. The next factor related to poor asthma control is in people who have mental health problems. So when reviewing somebody after an asthma attack, check through the records and also ask the person whether they have any mental health problems. We've known for a long time, many, many years, that people with combined asthma and mental health problems are at increased risk of having asthma attacks and in fact increased risk of dying from their asthma. Therefore, once identified, any mental health problems should be addressed. And the final potentially preventable risk factor relates to people with asthma who also are living in poor socioeconomic um, uh, conditions. So people in the higher deprivation categories. And a number of research papers have concluded that people living in deprived areas are at increased risk of attacks and amongst the highest numbers of people contributing to unscheduled care attendances in hospitals. So in this podcast, and in the last four episodes, I've shared my thoughts about potentially modifiable risk factors for poor asthma control and preventable asthma attacks and deaths. The seven-point plan is intended to identify any of these factors as part of the investigation following treatment of everyone who's had an asthma attack. So these can be addressed by optimizing care for each of these patients and importantly also to modify the systems in place in primary care practices in order to remove these risk factors and prevent future attacks. So by organizing and attending planned regular seven-step meetings in practices All practice staff, including receptionists, managers, as well as clinical staff, will become aware of and be able to identify risk factors in in those with poorly controlled asthma. Of course, having done so, action is needed to ensure those patients are reviewed as soon as possible by appropriately trained individuals. Finally, I've spoken about the potentially modifiable risk factors. However, there are a few other risk factors that are not modifiable, but which are important to identify to ensure that treatment is optimized for people with these. I realize that I did mention pregnancy as a modifiable risk factor. Of course, it's not a modifiable risk factor. Once you're pregnant, you're pregnant. But what can be modified is to ensure that treatment is not stopped during pregnancy. So the other non-modifiable risk factors include patients who have severe asthma, and severe asthma is defined as asthma, which is poorly controlled despite adequate high doses of inhaled corticosteroid medication, and that the medication is being taken correctly using correct inhaler technique as advised to do so. So severe asthma is defined retrospectively in somebody with poor asthma control, and that includes somebody who's had an asthma attack in the last six or eight months, as well as who has current symptoms, despite being on high-dose treatment that they're taking regularly and correctly. So people with moderate to severe airflow obstruction, that is FEV1 values, that's four six respiratory volume one values, below 60% of the predicted levels, are also at risk of poor asthma outcomes. And so anyone who has moderately um, severe obstruction of their airways on lung function testing 
also needs um, uh, careful attention and possible um, shared care with a specialist. And the last group um, of people with non-modifiable risk factors are those people who've had a previous life-threatening asthma attack. Now, of course, a previous asthma attack is always a risk factor for a future asthma attack. But if someone's had a previous life-threatening attack, they are at risk of having a severe asthma attack, possibly an asthma attack leading to death for the rest of their lives. So somebody who's had a life-threatening asthma attack, like someone who's been treated in intensive care or been on artificial or um, in mechanical ventilation, needs to be followed up forever by somebody with expertise in asthma. So anyone with one or more of these risk factors, these non-modifiable risk factors, should be under supervision of an asthma specialist. So in summary, asthma is an ongoing chronic disease which is prone to flare-ups and attacks. Now, when someone has an asthma attack, it's a serious, significant event and should not be treated without also optimizing the management of the underlying chronic disease, asthma. So soon after someone has been treated for an asthma attack, they should be reviewed to first establish whether the attack is resolved or whether any additional treatment is needed. And secondly, part of the management of the attack includes a review by someone trained in asthma care to identify and deal with any modifiable risk factors for future attacks. So, over the course of the last half dozen podcasts, I've suggested a seven-point plan and spoken about some practical ways to implement this. And this is a plan for all those in primary care practices to review the medical records of every single person who has an asthma attack and then discuss the findings in a regular, dedicated meeting, followed by optimization of the individual person's asthma care, and also by modifying systems in the practice for caring for people with asthma. So please do have a look at the link in the, in the description of this podcast um, for a full explanation of the seven-step plan.